turn it over to Laura. I am going to turn off my camera so she can have the whole screen because she is going to take us through with video and no slide. Um, so I will be here if there are any questions or any technical issues, just uh, pop them in the chat and take it away, Laura. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and uh, it's awesome to be live streaming. I'm live streaming to two places right now. One is the uh, on bigmarker.com, the uh, New England Graphic Medicine Now Digital Summit, which is very cool, but I'm also live streaming on Facebook Live since a lot of my artners are on there. So I wanna say hello and welcome to everybody and thank you for tuning in on this Saturday morning. Welcome to this edition of my book tour, which I was calling Laura Lee Live, but now I'm calling Artner Live because Really, it's uh, I'm being supported by a lot of partners right now, and I feel like the, this opportunity as an introvert being forced into making videos uh, is really sort of kickstarting a dream that Lark and I have talked about a long time of doing an partner show. So it's amazing what creative problem solving will force us to do and come out of our comfort zone. Um, so like I mentioned, this is a virtual version of an event that was gonna be in person this weekend in Boston. Um, and it is all about healing. So I'm actually really excited to spend the next, I don't know, hour and a half or two hours with you guys today, depending on how long it takes me to go through everything. Um, so I'm, and I'm gonna have um, slides over here sort of talk, showing what I'm talking about. So if you're watching this video later, you, if there's a certain part that you want to check out, then you can sort of fast forward to like the part that you're most interested in. So I want to thank you guys, first of all, for watching. And I guess I'm going to be talking about five things in this video this morning. Um, so the first thing is how I use art as creative expression, because to me, that's my number one style of art therapy uh, is on myself. Uh, the thing that helps me, you know, the most in this world is a coping strategy. I'm also going to walk through how to make a self-care plan, which is so important that I actually have it in the back of my new book. Um, and it's something that I've been talking about a lot. So I'm gonna get into more detail about how to uh, maybe make your own self-care plan with dealing with everything that's going on right now. I feel like in a strange way now, everybody can experience what it's like to be a highly sensitive person because that's what I normally experience with heightened emotions and feeling overstimulated and not having a strong armor about dealing with certain stimuli. Um, and I feel like now everyone is sort of experiencing some of the symptoms of highly sensitive people. So I hope that I can give some insights. The third thing I'll talk about is uh, activating artner love. Uh, because to me, that's a huge part of easing isolation in the studio. So both real people and imaginary people as part of your support system. So I'll talk about that. Then the fourth thing, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how I model these healing behaviors in the new book. Because I really wanted her story to express through narrative some of the things that I talk about. Because I feel like we can talk about how important it is to do certain behaviors that are, we know are good for us, but it's really modeling them ourselves that I feel like is the best way to convey this information is just to walk your walk instead of just talking your talk. So Mona is an interesting, uh, was an interesting opportunity for me to actually draw about some of the stuff that I do for myself, but I hadn't actually, I don't know, I didn't want to seem preachy with people and like, yo, you should meditate. Um, so it was interesting to explore that through her as a character. And then the last thing, uh, because this is a conference uh, about graphic medicine, I realize it's a new concept to a lot of people, especially uh, librarians that I'm meeting who are unfamiliar with this new uh, emerging genre in comics, which I think is really exciting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what graphic medicine is, what are some of the books that I think are really inspiring that are also talking about healing and health. So that's like the blurry watercolor of what we're going to be talking about today. And I invite you to please chime in with questions or comments. Um, and I'm going to
going to like pause at different intervals to answer those the best I can. Um, so yeah, I guess it's going to be a little bit of a, of a seed bomb of ideas and inspiration. So uh, on the Facebook Live, my partner is going to be putting in links to some things um, to help spread some information because I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you guys out. But really, it's because I want us all to thrive through this time, to survive and thrive um, and vibe <laughs> through this time. Um, so grab a seat, grab some tea, and take some notes, and let's have a lovely, lovely time together. Okay, so first of all, um, using art, oh wait, I got my flip chart. Oh, number one, using creative expression as art therapy. This is something I started to do in graduate school uh, when I was really stressed out. I feel like that I was I mean, the first, I didn't get to, I wasn't depressed in high school. I got depressed in college. I feel like college is when it hit me because that's when I needed to really figure out where I fit in into the, in the real world. And I didn't see myself plugging into any of the existing boxes. Um, and so, and it was also the time, it was like in one year, it was like Columbine, 9-11, and the standardized test tsunami was coming over. Like I could just see the wave. And so that's when I started making art like for myself as art therapy, because I was re getting really disillusioned about, okay, I'm entering the public education system as a teacher. What does this actually mean? What, how, what is art good for in the real world when there's real problems going around? Um, so I started making art for myself almost as an experiment. So I, because uh, one of the teachers I knew, she had a sketchbook and she did a project with her students where she challenged them to focus on quantity instead of quality. She said, just focus on filling as many pages as possible and don't worry about if the pages are like final artifacts, you know, it's more just about getting anything out. So maybe it's drawing, maybe it's collage, maybe it's text. Um, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to take a page from her book. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to sort of flip through, let's see if I can do this on video. Like, so this is one of my sketchbooks. This is the fourth one. So I'm just going to flip through random stuff. Everything from, um, you know, oh, this is a, this is a great one here. The foolish brave one. So this is like a little glimpse into the sort of stuff that I would do in my sketchbook. There'd be some self portraits like this, but some would be, this is drawing a song, um, some doing with collage. Oh, how to show this on video. Some are like photos that I had taken. I learned the graphite doesn't work well because <laughs> it smudges. Some of them are comics. Um, yeah, so this is the sort of thing that I would do in my sketchbook. Here's a fun little cutout. Um, the sort of thing I would do in my sketchbook. Um, and I was drawing about my emotions like a lot. Um, you know, if something bad happened, I draw about that. Um, da, 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 heartbreak, money. Yeah, so I would draw myself as a character and um, this process, which I didn't realize was really art therapy at the time, but now looking back, I'm like, yes, it was art therapy. Um, I did this for four years in sketchbooks and then I started working on loose paper. So let me just show off a little more and then I'll get, walk you guys through how I do this. So, yeah, this is fun when I do school visits. I'll like pass around, let's see, I don't know, good way to show this. But like, I'd work on loose paper, um, doing just, I don't know, tons of self-portraits. And I didn't realize at the time that these were all stills, like from a movie, like all spliced and cut up and out of order. So I would just draw different things like the black hole in my heart. Or yeah, here's that foolish brave one again. Um, I know if I was tech savvy, I would know how to do this on a com on the computer, but I don't. But I just want to give you sort of an idea of the pieces that I make. And I call and I ended up making 15. I have 1500 pieces in a Flickr gallery. Uh, on my Flickr page and I call it the art no one cares about because my personal work like this sort of work my art therapy work that's the stuff that I consider my real work 
you know, the graphic novels are sort of the result of all mining all these different emotions and sort of polishing each little nugget. And when I have enough of them, then I can string them together into a beautiful necklace that is a plot line. Um, but to me, I can't make the books unless I have this personal practice of, okay, what am I feeling right now? How can I give it visual form? So I'll start by journaling. Journaling is always like the first step to pulling out, uh, at least for art therapy inspired pieces. So let's see, what's a good example? I've pulled out some different things. So like here's a couple different versions of how like the beginning will look for me. So first I'll do journaling just to figure out what is going on because normally there's three or four ideas all strung together. And I drew about this in Mona like this. Let's see, I'm holding up to two cameras right now. <laughs> Where, because I, I feel like I'll like vomit out a bunch of words like, ah, this is how I feel. And then as I start to pull through it, I'll realize that there's actually a few different emotions all tangled up together, a few different thoughts. So the first step for me is to write it all out so I can see it and I can start to pull apart like, okay, I'm feeling anxious. I'm also feeling like mourning and I'm also feeling like excitement. Um, and so once I separate them, then I can explore each one individually. And I find that's like the hardest part is to first just like shake out what's really going on so the dust can like settle um, and I can label each one. Because labeling the emotion is really hard to eat, just dig a little bit and reflect like, well, do I really feel angry or is it really something else that's going on? Am I actually jealous or, uh, so there's some, some reflection to dig until I get to what I feel like it's really about. And that's normally when I get that feeling of, ooh, if it's something surprising or difficult, um, or it, I don't know, there's normally some clip where I'm like, oh, that's what it's really about. Normally it's something that doesn't make me look good. And so after journaling is when I can start to do like sketches, like here's just like a couple of sort of what my process looks like. Um, just sort of sketching out teeny images of kind of what I imagine in my head. Um, because for me, since I'm a very visual thinker, like maybe some of you guys, um, when I write, I use a lot of visual language. So if I'm using a metaphor or an image in my, in my journaling, I will latch on to that. Um, and or challenge myself, think, well, what does this feel like? Um, so I try to invoke the metaphor within the, the emotion to give me a picture to hang the emotion on like a hook. Um, so like some of my recent round, I had a lot of ideas, so <laughs> it was sort of like more this layout. So this is how I'll start all my, my personal pieces, like on a piece of notebook paper, very, you know, casually, no pressure. And I'll start to do tiny thumbnails and maybe a little bit of text to sort of give it context. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but when I draw like really tiny thumbnails, oftentimes they have this really lovely like gestural quality that I'll lose if I try to redraw it big. So I actually will blow up like my little thumbnail sketches. I'll often like blow these up to big size to use to trace for my final piece. Um, so like, I'll start off by journaling, then do my thumbnails. So like here's another example of like some thumbnails. Um, and the thumbnails are important because this is when I play with camera angles. And I find that this part is really psychological because, oh, and when I say camera angles, just to inform you guys. So camera angles are a fancy word for point of view. Um, it's like a, you know, there's a lot of parallels with filmmaking, I feel like at this part of the process of trying to give visual form to something that you're seeing in your head. So it's just thinking about, well, am I gonna be close up? Am I gonna be far away? Am I, what is my point of view? So sometimes even just figuring that out about my own drawing, it's like, well, am I, is it from my point of view or am I, some, am I looking at myself? In my head, in this picture, are my eyes closed or are they open? And so basically I'm just asking myself a series of questions like a director to give it form um, and to define 
what this ethereal thing in my head is to like make decisions. Like, okay, um, like this one was tricky because uh, like when I did my cartoon sketch, because I don't know if you guys know this, but cartoon actually means like the sketch before a final piece. So um, even though we think cartoons like is an animated cartoons, but that's like the classical sense of cartoon. So this is a cartoon. <laughs> so this is the sketch for like a final piece, but like I have, I had this image with like these doors in my chest, but then I was like drawing it this way and I was like, no, this isn't right because the doors are go going back, they're going in. I was like, really, it should be, the doors should be opening, you know? So I gotta, so it's interesting to me how just figuring out the picture, it reveals a lot to me about what it's, it really creates a door for me to access certain parts of my, uh, my emotions and part of my subconscious. Because really I think that's what art is, it just gives you a window into your subconscious and you can almost bypass your logical brain to help reveal some information that you need. Because whenever I make each piece of art, there's always a moment where it surprises me and I feel like that's when it really has a healing effect is when I'm just using it as a way for my subconscious to give me information. Um, Yes, yeah, so my personal process is very much like how oh, journal. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry to uh, interrupt the flow, but there's been some um, discussion in the chat that it's a little bit hard to see the drawings when you hold them up. So if it's possible to hold them a little bit closer to the. Uh huh. Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> I know. It's, it's a little tricky situation sharing. Also, I draw in blue pencil, which is notoriously hard to see. Um, <laughs> here, maybe this is like a little, wait, that's upside down. <laughs> if you can get them as close to the camera as possible when you hold them mm -hmm. up, it does seem to be uh, helping. <laughs> All right, well, you get the idea. So, um, yeah, so for, I would invite you if you, have a lot of emotions, you know, coming up like right now in life. Um, to start by, I mean, you might not be a journal, but for me, uh, journaling is helpful to just sort of open the door to access what emotions are going on and giving it a receptacle to like vomit it all in. Um, then you can start to like detangle it um and look for the images that you're already writing about so i find that I've, you already use language that sort of is giving you a clue of like a direction to go in um and then playing with a few thumbnails to think about like yeah and what's the point of view i see of this in my head um and then doing like a larger sketch and for me like you can just draw it on a piece of paper i generally draw it on like a crappy piece of paper and then I'll trace it onto like a nice sheet of paper. So this is the rhythm that I have found for my personal pieces after like hundreds of them because at the beginning you just have an idea and you just draw it but after doing the same rhythm like over and over and over this is sort of the logic like the the pattern that I found is that generally my ideas come in threes because it seems like three things have to be going on in my head to overwhelm me, to force me to do art about it. Um, <laughs> one thing is okay, two is manageable, but once there's three things going on, then I have to do something. Um, so that's normally what gives me the urgency that I have to actually draw this out. And it's like an exorcism, because once I draw it and I see it, then I don't have to carry it around anymore. And also normally it teaches me something about myself. Um, just even the way I'm drawing it because I'll try to also draw in a way that I find some hope because sometimes if you draw about feeling sad you feel more sad you know because then you're just like ruminating in it so if I feel sad then I'll think like well what am I really trying to say about sadness instead of just oh I'm sad um like even recently I drew myself as a little astronaut on the inside and I was like but I gave the astronaut a little jetpack 
because I didn't want it to because I wanted to seem like okay I'm in charge of my locomotion I'm just choosing to be in there right now but I can come back uh, because I was like I could have a tether but that's not what it feels like it feels like totally cut off so it's interesting to me how when I the small choices that I make and how I draw something it's like me taking charge of my own narrative um, because we create a reality so yeah there's a lot of power in uh, choosing how you're going to see a situation um, so let's see da, da, da. oh and I want to also mention other ways to that I'll do art therapy that are not as productive as drawing because I feel like you don't always have to be productive to for because um, I feel like I focus on that a lot but there's ways to express yourself that maybe are less about creating like a final work of art so there's a lot to be said for just scribbling which a uh, friend just Darby just posted about today uh, finger painting is also a really like a go-to activity for me when I'm just stressed out and I just need to feel like fit the physicality of getting like my hands in paint it's very it activates like the the sense memory of when you were a kid just playing um, and connecting with that just joy of the joy of making marks on paper which is pretty amazing um, and very empowering and makes you feel like you got a lot of agency in life even though if you don't always have agency for everything happening um, also collage I really love to do collage with like old calendars and things when I feel like making something but I don't want to be I don't know like using my brain too much I just sort of want to physically move stuff around um, and of course uh, singing uh, I've been doing a lot of singing in the studio uh, which is a fun type of expression that really I feel like releases a lot of pent-up energy straight out of my body versus filtering it through my hands and of course dance uh, I just posted a dance video uh, yesterday actually to celebrate other types of outlets that I've been enjoying um, that are also diversifying what skills of mine I'm tapping into so I've drawn so much so now I'm like okay how can I apply this to a medium that I'm not as familiar with and have that beginner's mindset all over again and then other things that I like to do that are very therapeutic but not as productive um, I'm a big fan of fixing things and sewing projects like sort of tapping into those skills and of course uh, oh when I, I spent like six months digging in the back of my parents um, like the woods behind my parents house like sort of landscaping which was really cathartic so I feel like digging in soil and like um, yeah landscaping and those sorts of projects gardening it's really satisfying even though it might not feel like creative in the typical artistic sense um, these are ways that I found I mean any I mean to me even creative is just an outlet for taking this energy in here and getting it out of you so whether it's pictures or words or movement or um, yeah really it's just about getting it out <laughs> and uh, so dun, dun, dun. yeah and uh, I feel like my favorite drawing activity is in case you guys are curious not to plug myself but my last book is an interactive sketchbook called sketchbook dares Ooh, ah. And it's full of drawing prompts. Of course, why am I opening up to all the blank pages? Oh my goodness, this is terrible. Um, so it has a, a wide array of different drawing prompts and activities based on both my sketchbook, but also um, lessons that I developed as a teacher and in working in schools. Oh, like this one is about drawing music, which is something I love to do if I don't feel like drawing something about like my personal feelings it's like let's just draw some sounds um, and make something that's just about shape and color Ooh, it's hard for me to like ah, things so if you're looking for a sampling of different drawing activities to help you draw out some stuff then this is what I past tense me already made high five past tense me and it features because um, when I draw stuff for myself I have a very holistic approach so it's a quarter activities for the hands um, more about drawing skills than a quarter about the heart more about emotional intelligence a quarter um, more about the mind so more like logic and creative problem-solving and then a quarter that tap more into the spirit um, which is more stuff that gets you like out of your head 
Uh, so connecting with the bigger world and ancestors and stuff like that. So, dun, dun, dun. yes, so I guess, I guess I can see if there are any, if you guys have any questions on here, let me check before I move forward. So I haven't looked on here. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. And there's a Facebook one. Okay. And, and my assistant producer, Jawara, uh, <laughs> can let me know if there are Facebook questions to be answered. <laughs> Since I'm making things complicated and live streaming to two places. Okay. So I'm going to move on to talk about number two. I can turn the paper. How to make a self-care plan. Uh, I feel that self-care has been thrown around a lot uh, lately as a buzzword, and it's often associated with things that are very, uh, I don't know, privileged and superficial and self-indulgent and like fluffy bubble baths and things like that. Um, so I guess my personal, um, perspective on self-care is that it's, it's healthcare. Um, it is, wait, let me do this. To me, it's about taking ownership of your own needs as a human being. To me, it's like very grown up. Um, and identifying the things that you know you need in life and taking charge of getting those things. Um, so like, for me, I've definitely noticed as a highly sensitive person over the years that there's certain patterns that have emerged of what triggers certain emotions or like, and my art has given me the opportunity to actually identify a lot of these things. So I feel really lucky that I've sort of been forced into figure like learning what helps me function and navigate through the world. Cause I think that's part of artists jobs is to figure out how we can live and thrive and navigate through this world in one piece. And just by doing that, we change the world around us. So like when I go to comic cons, oh, comic cons, um, <laughs> I, always, I bring my self care plan with me and I generally start conversations with other creators. I'm like, like I have a plant on my table because we're under fluorescent lighting all day and it makes me feel disconnected from reality. So I have a plant. Uh, I, I bring lots of food. I bring hot tea because it's always cold in there and I know it's always cold in there. So instead of complaining about it being cold, it's like, well, I'm going to bring some tea to set myself up for success. Um, so I feel like that uh, the, I'm modeling doing things that are healthy for me and then other people are like, actually, that would help me too. I'm like, yes. It's not obnoxious or annoying to be like, hey, I'm a human who needs to eat and needs to sleep and has physical needs versus I'm gonna sit at a table for like 12 hours and not leave. Uh, it's like, no, I'm gonna go take a break and see sunlight for five minutes because it'll make me a lot happier and able to handle dealing with all the social interaction. So to me, it's the opposite of frivolous. If anything, it's just, it's, being very like adults and standing up for also yourself. It's an act of compassion for everybody because if I'm getting what I need, I'm a lot nicer to be around and I can be a lot more helpful dealing with other problems. You know, it's like they say, you gotta put on your own oxygen mask first before you can help other people. It can feel selfish to do that. But it's at this point in time, um, especially I feel like we, it's, it's easy to almost like martyr ourselves for things like, oh, what can I do to help? And I'm going to make sacrifices. It's like, well, part of how I can help is to make sure that I'm strong and healthy and emotionally resilient enough to handle things. So instead of just throwing myself into stuff, like maybe just make sure that I'm tethering myself to what like I need to be tethered to before I dive in. So then at least I can come back and not be so reckless with myself because as a sensitive person, it's harder for me to recover from stress. Things get me and it's harder to bounce back sometimes. Um, so something oops, I want to mention with self care is that the term contemplative practice is never associated with self care. Uh, I recently did a workshop at the Freyland right before quarantine closed everything down. 
uh, about mindfulness and creative practice because mindfulness and self-care and contemplative practice to me they're all sort of connected um, even though maybe in the zeitgeist they're not um, so when I say mindfulness what do I mean by that okay, I have a helpful diagram okay so my basic image of mindfulness is it's about being in the present um, I mean we all go into the past and the future we just can't help it as people you know, if we go in the past too much, we get depressed because we think about how things used to be. If we go in the future too much, we get anxious because we're trying to plan things out, uh, which is like right now, this is the problem. Because <laughs> um, to survive, brain wants to go into the future. It wants to like figure out what's next. And so it's making it even harder to be here in the present because brain doesn't want to be here. It wants to go other places. So self-care helps me stay in the present um, and the word contemplative um, let's see contemplative which is another fancy word for for mindfulness um, there's a lovely handout which i should put this on my website because it's not currently on my website but i'm going to put it up there but it's a tree here i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up close because that's like i'll hold you guys in a second um ah, holding up things but it's a tree of contemplative practices, which actually, I'm gonna hold that up over here, which actually is a lot of self-care practices in my mind, because contemplative just means that you are in the present and your attention is focused on what you're doing. So, um, so I just wanted to throw that in there because I feel like just to put it in the greater context that self-care fits into mindful, compassion, contemplative world, um, just in case that wasn't on your radar. So with my, I feel like the, the self-care helps before I get into like the how-to, um, I just want to point out that one thing that it really helps me with is connecting with my physical body, because I feel like a lot of us, we spend a lot of time up here in our head, um, maybe too much time on the internet, uh, maybe too much time on the internet. I mean, there's both nets you can hang out in. Uh, but I feel like that when I feel stress, I hang out up here versus being embodied, like in my actual physical body. So contemplative practices, self-care practices, mindful practices, these things help plug my brain and my body like back together um, so that I'm not just lost up here. So even when I meditate, a lot of times I'll visualize my energies like going down because my problem is that I don't feel grounded like to reality all the time because sometimes reality is hard and I don't want to be here in this present. I want to retreat up here. I want to go other places in my mind, in my imagination, which is really cool sometimes, but you can get lost in there. Um, so these are things that I feel like help tether me to my body and to the present and to reality, which are all three things I sometimes just want to run away from. Okay, so um, I'm gonna run through how to make your self-care plan. I'm gonna do my best to like hold it up in front of in front of screens, but also on my website I have a PDF of my of the self-care plan that's in the back of Mona. So you can, um, if you go to my website, it's on the learning section. The learning section is my new section where I put all my handouts for uh, that I've been giving out on school visits because I realized I should just totally have them on my on my website so anyone can download them. So you can get the Mona one. It is um, includes a blank one, so it'll have a blank one for you to fill out as well as a copy of mine in the book. I just updated it because I'm adding stuff to it all the time. So this is my my current self care plan. Oh good, someone put up that link. <laughs> um, so on my self-care plan, oh I can tell this is not gonna be ideal to share via video. So I'm gonna have to read stuff out. But hmm. Hmm. Hey Jay, can you see this on the Facebook one? Because it's looking here. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find a good spot I can hold it that it can be visible. Um but like I said, you can find the handout on my website. Basically, let's see, I got my 
the physical needs. Okay, cool. I'll just stand here. Okay, so my physical needs. Uh, I have outlined my physical needs, emotional needs, and mental needs. So this is like one half of the self-care plan, which is basically identifying all the stuff that you know helps you. Um, so to me, this is like the easy part. Um, the other half are um, the extra things that support you and your stress warning signs. Um, so, um, so these are sort of like the two halves of the self-care plan. So the physical needs, I'll just run through some of them. I feel like a lot of these things, people are like, oh, I have those needs too. You know, things like sleep, um, no caffeine after 2 p.m., cheese levels, because I have to have cheese every day, um, natural beauty, um, you know, affection. Unfortunately, I can't get my eight hugs a day right now. Um, stretching breaks from my desk. Um, walking out in nature, which I do every day after being in the studio, you know, yoga, physical therapy, limiting, drinking, um, then things like, of course I got like having the face scrub in there, um, but even other stuff like using a heating pad if I have um, like a joint that needs some attention or using a weighted blanket, which I do love me the weighted blankets. <laughs> I have a 20 pounder, which is really intense. It almost, you can't get out. Um, and then regular stuff like um, wearing a wrist brace when I clean or um, wearing a fanny pack instead of a regular shoulder bag, things like that. So a lot of this stuff I feel like is, is universal. Then emotional needs for me, let's see, emotional needs. So these are things like, and see, actually, since I don't think you can read it, I'm just gonna like read it from back here because that's like easier. So emotional needs, um, it's everything from like singing to um, time in nature, time with kids, time with animals, time, time in water, friend dates, um, introvert social recovery time, since I know that when I do really social things, I need recovery, you know, I need time as a, to like recharge my, my batteries, uh, contemplative dance, um, toning and humming. Oh, this is like a newer thing. Um, inspired by some of my sound friends. Um, so like one thing I've been doing is, cause toning is when you sing a note that like slides, like ah, and then humming is really good for you. Um, it activates your vagus nerve, which runs through your whole body. So I've been combining hmm, humming and toning. So I've been doing sort of hmm, um, like uh, I was doing it the other day when I was hanging laundry and it actually was really, actually almost felt like this morning sort of wail. It was actually really comforting and therapeutic. I, I was like, I probably look like and sound like a strange person right now, um, but I'm gonna do what I need to do <laughs> to feel better. Let's see, mental needs, everything from, you know, I have daily, weekly, regularly, yearly. Um, you know, I have a fictional assistant. So every Sunday, my fictional assistant plans my week and I make sure that I have time off each week. Uh, I have contemplative chores. So when I wash dishes, I use it as a mindful practice. Um, then of course, like journaling, artnering, art personal art time, learning things, reading, um, knowing my warning signs, meditation every day, um, no screens after 9.30, um, limited social media, limited violent content, limited news intake. Um, and then some yearly things that I do for my self-care include making the self-care plan. Um, I also will make a special plan for when I know I'm gonna have a stressful time, like if I have a residency or something where I'm very social and very on, I'll make a specific, I'll like pick out stuff from here and make like a little extra, like a special self-care plan. And another thing I'll do is, um, like uh, when, for my own medical, for going to the doctor, I, f I don't know if other people have had this experience, but maybe it's, a, it's a, a female quandary, but I feel like it's really hard for me to stand up for myself. Um, and it's hard for me to vocalize that I need help with something or that there's actually a problem or to stand up for myself. So I have like a folder with all my healthcare documents when I go to the doctor's office and it's covered in like empowering stickers to like, like, you got it, girl, and like, yeah, you're amazing, and uh, 
to make me feel more confident because I don't know why I get really like anxious in there. Um, but I also made a one pager. I don't want to hold it up too close because it's like my entire medical history, but I made a one pager. I'll hold it like back here. <laughs> Uh, it's basically a diagram of my body and I've written in everything my entire medical history visually because I'm like many people where I've seen so many different doctors over the years and you don't have a lot of time with them So it's almost like a one-pager to help advocate for me so they can understand um, So this is like a newer part of the my self-care plan that I initiated which I didn't real, realize is self-care but really anything that you're doing to help take charge of your own health and well-being, that's what it means. Uh, because yes, sometimes you have to be your own healthcare advocate. Um, and then, okay, so these are all like the things that I know I need. So on the other side, let's see, I have daily supplements. So these are all things that I like intentionally take on a regular basis to sort of balance out bad food choices in real life. Um, so like every day I have, I have wheat germ on my breakfast, I have prunes at lunch, uh, I have Tulsi tea almost every day, I eat vegetarian. Other things that I find helpful, of course lately I've been putting rose in a lot of things, thank you Larkin for sending me a lot of rose stuff. Um, and um, really into ginger turmeric, uh, of course I have like vitamins and fish oil and vitamin D and uh, probiotics and things. I guess, um, my supplements are geared towards gut health because I had an issue that inspired Mona where I grew a mass in my intestines and the doctors couldn't explain it. And it was like, well, that's not comforting. So I'm just going to try to make sure that my body doesn't kill me. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I feel like I'd be curious to know what things like help other people actually. Cause I'm, always, cause I feel like this category looks really small on my self care plan. So I didn't want to like bulk it up as much as possible. Um, the next thing that's also sort of like a daily supplement is your support system. Support system! Ooh. Um, and so this includes, I like to think of the support system as you should make it as expansive as possible. Uh, so I include my, my, my biological family because you know, blood is blood and they always got your back. Um, but all, don't forget your world family, which can include, you know, partners, partners, lovers, friends, mentors, teachers, um, yeah, a lot of people can be in the world family. Um, but also to me, there's some invisible partners in this category too. There's the historical mentors, which uh, what my friend Vivek calls them, who are um, the role models that you've never met in person. Like for me, one of mine is Jim Henson who I can pull strength and wisdom from, and I sort of like feel their support. Um, but also your ancestors, like a lot of times I'll tap into them and they're really awesome cheerleaders. Um, and then you got your, your magical helpers, which for me are like my, my creative genius, who I'm gonna talk about in a future video. I'm gonna talk about how to make magical helpers. Well, they're already there. So really it's just embodying your magical helpers. So I got my creative genius, I got my fictional assistant, um, you also might have, I don't know, a guardian angel or an animal spirit. I feel like there's a lot of different things in your support system that you might not think is in your support system. Um, but expanding that as much as possible and having it written down is really comforting, especially now when it's easy to feel really isolated and alone. Um, so yeah, like see how many people um, are, or animals or a mad personified spirits are in your support system um, and find different ways to, to lean on them for support even if it's just like in your mind like I don't know to feel witnessed by an ancestor in your situation um, and let's see so next is da -da -da, the stress warning signs oh yeah this one has been really fun it was easy to add some things on there lately uh, so for me, my stress warning signs, I think a lot of them are universal, um, but some of them may be more for me. So my warning signs are um, insomnia, melancholia, appetite loss, overindulgence, working late, racing thoughts, racing heart, excessive nail biting, feeling overwhelmed, pain in different parts of my body, um, hunched over body language, excessive future tripping or nostalgia, 
um, trouble with eye contact or eye twitching or eye styes. I got eye issues. Um, trouble communicating or listening. Like I really have trouble talking when I'm not doing well. I've actually been making a red flag card to help me so when I'm in that moment, I can just mark a box to say what I need because I really have trouble saying, like in my head I'm screaming, but in person I'm like Meh. So it's hard for me to be like, help, I need help right now. Um, so I've been working on that as a tool for my toolbox. Um, I get really defensive and guarded and isolate. I lose confidence. Uh, oftentimes I get really sweaty and my temperature drops. So even just noticing the things like writing down and like almost owning like, okay, I know these are my warning signs. So now when these things come up, like when all my fingers are bleeding because I've been biting them all so much, then I'll say, oh, maybe things aren't doing so well in my head right now because my fingers are all bleeding. Maybe we should do something from our physical, emotional, or mental needs list and do that right now. Because what I find helpful about actually writing down this stuff, because you might think to yourself, oh, well, I know what my warning signs are. I know what helps me. I know who's in my support system. But writing it and having it posted like in your studio, to me, makes a huge difference because now when I'm not in a good place and I can't make good decisions, then I have something like, okay, Laura Lee, you're not in a good headspace right now. You're being sort of like self-destructive. Um, just pick something on this list to do. Pick some person on your support system to call. And it gives me like an easy action step when I like can't make a decision and I can't think straight. And the last thing in the list is on the very bottom, I put my red flag ritual. That's what I call it when I, I feel like really dizzy and overwhelmed with like whatever is happening and I just need to a scene change, you know? Um, and so the red flag ritual is like, you know, when in doubt. So when in doubt, I, I make tea, I take a shower, because taking a shower always helps. Um, I light incense, because something about the scent helps me do a scene change. Um, and I'll do a stair step breath. That's where, it's basically like deep breathing, but stair step breath is where um, you basically, you know, imagine your lungs going all the way from like your collarbone, like down to the bottom of your rib cage, which I don't think you see in this video, um, because your lungs are a lot bigger than you might think. And a lot of times when we're stressed, or at least when I'm stressed, I breathe really shallow. So I just like feel like the top part of my lungs, like, because when I'm stressed, my body's sort of in like freak out mode. Um, but, and so it's harder to like actually breathe and like use, fill my whole lungs with air. So a stair step breath is like where you breathe in like really deep to actually fill the bottom of your, like your lungs, like down at the bottom of your rib cage. So like feeling all the way down there. And then uh, like I'll like press that down when I'm like, see, I'm not good at teaching breathing exercises. So I'm not a yoga teacher, yogurt, yoga teacher, Ugh, real professional. But it's basically where you do like a three part breath, where you visualize the bottom part of your lungs, the, the part around your, your rib cage, <laughs> and then the part of by your collarbone. So it's like that, that, and that. And then feeling this, this, and this. And I'll do that for like a few times and that'll really help me just fill my body with oxygen because that's really helpful and cannot be understated. Because if you're breathing really shallow, you're not getting a lot of oxygen in there. Um, so even just making an intentional like couple breaths. Because also when I'm drawing I t and writing, I tend to hold my breath. Because there's something a little suspenseful about it or maybe I'm just trying not to mess something up. And so I tend to like hold it. So even when I'm like drawing, I'll like think about like, okay, we're gonna exhale as we draw this line. Like, <sighs> And it actually makes the art a lot better when I'm, I don't know, more embodied. Um, and so, da -da -da. I guess the last step of the self-care plan is to share it with other people. Uh, it's good to like make it and put it in your house somewhere so that you can see it. But what's more important is to share it with the people in your support system. Uh, so they know what your stress warning signs are so they know what you need because they will help hold you accountable 
Um, so I think that's really essential. So if I'm being all like scatterbrain, uh, like for me, I have appetite loss and so I have trouble eating. And so if someone is like, Laura Lee, you haven't like eaten anything for like all day. And it's like, you should probably, it's like, yes, you're right. I should probably eat some, you know, I need people to help hold me accountable to meeting my needs. Cause you think that by knowing your needs, then you would meet them, but we're not, it doesn't always work like that. So include it with other people. And I don't always do everything on this list cause I'm not, I'm not perfect. Um, but I feel like I do a lot of it. And that itself is a huge win and it is, I guess I've been working on this for the past like four years, ever since I got that mass in my intestines and almost killed me. And so the self-care plan, yours might look different. This is how it started like years ago, like this was a couple years ago. So, but before this, it was really only like 12 things. It was like 12 things on my self-care plan and that was it. And each year I keep adding and I really feel like it's just turning into my life. So now, Eventually, I want my whole life to basically be my self-care because that means that everything I'm doing is replenishing me and not depleting me. That's another, I guess, way you could think about what is should be on your list is what fills your well versus what taps you out. Because um, we don't always think about think about that, but as an introvert who thinks a lot about how energy is drained, I think about it a lot. Um, and I guess. My favorite, let's see, I mentioned, uh, I guess my, fa my favorite practices I'll just make sure to highlight is the time in nature, uh, which I think everyone is really getting into right now, which is awesome. So I generally hike at the end of every studio day to prevent myself from overworking, um, to like cut myself off. And, uh, and I don't do creative, creative work after dinner because then it will sweep me away and I'll be up until like two and no. Um, so I have very strict boundaries with my work and my life and I have my fictional assistant helps me with that. Um, and right now in the studio, something that's really been helping me helping is I listen to, um, different radio stations online in the studio when I'm, cause I work in the studio alone. So like right now I've been really into KXP out of Seattle, John in the morning. Oh, like listening to real live humans. Um, like when you're in your studio, it makes you feel much more connected to different communities in the world. Sometimes I'll listen to the Hawaiian station on the big island, uh, KWXX. Um, sometimes I'll listen to WFUV in New York. Sometimes I listen to WRUV in, uh, in Burlington, Vermont. So I tap into different communities and hang out with them to feel like I'm not alone in the studio. And besides that, I also like uh, live music. So like live albums, like for example, are really make you feel like that you're part of the world, even if you're alone in your in your at your desk in your in your house. Um, so yeah, those are the two like because also they tap into music, and music is a huge part of my mental health. Like um, I'm always making playlists and finding music that excites me with fascinating rhythms, and it helps. I don't know, it activates that like pleasure, happy center that wants me to stay in reality because there's new mu music to be excited about. And yeah, okay. And my partner, uh, Lauren Larkin, she's actually been working on a song about self-care called Slather on the Self-Care. And she is gonna be posting it, I think on, we have an Artner page on Facebook. So I think she's gonna be posting it there very soon because she's been polishing it and getting it ready for release because now it's more relevant than ever. Um, and let's see, dun, dun, dun. so I'm curious if anybody has any questions. So I'm gonna look on the, um, on the conference website. I guess, Jay, if there are any Facebook ones, you can let me know that. X is too small. Yes, it's too small for that one. Any questions? Dun dun. Any over there, Jamar? Shall I move on? My co-producer is checking the Facebook questions. Cause I bet there's something on there. Cause I just I've thrown a lot of stuff out there. Um. 
And some of the things that I mentioned in my self-care plan might be unfamiliar to people. Um, I guess some things I didn't mention were I have a new ritual. I'm a big fan of rituals. Uh, as a nail biter, I've been trying not to bite my nails. Actually, coronavirus has really helped me to stop with my nail biting. <laughs> so that's the only positive. But when I catch myself biting my nails, I will stop and kiss them. To like, because I can't stop myself from biting my nails, but it's just a ritual to stop it when I notice it. Because sometimes I do it unconsciously, and we have to be a little kind. Yes. Just this? can we do this every Saturday? Can we do this every Saturday <laughs> for the foreseeable, sh the foreseeable future? It's going to be Art in Our Lives Saturday morning cartoons. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Or shall I move on? I say move on. Okay, I'll move on. Okay, going through a lot of things. Okay, we're on to number three. Number three of today's show, which is Activate Art and Love. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I just realized I was supposed to wear a heart and love. Oh well, in spirit. Yeah, so this is a, a big secret weapon that has helped me as a healthy creative because I feel like make, doing art therapy on myself, that's really great. Taking charge of my self-care for my physical needs is like awesome. Um, but then there's still the huge issue of isolation. Um, and so I was like a lot of creatives alone in my studio. Feel, especially as a cartoonist, which requires a lot of time by yourself and a, like deep thought in there. Um, and it's really hard to connect with other creatives sometimes because like I don't have co-workers um, by myself. Um, even the work I, I'm doing, it's pretty much I'm doing everything. And so I'm sort of a natural hermit. And so actually learning how to come out of my shell to include more people in my process has been really helpful. Oh, an artner, in case you haven't heard me use this word, is a partner in art. So it can mean someone who you collaborate on projects with, or it might just be somebody who is part of your support system. So like my primary artner, Lauren Larkin, she's a musician. So like we don't collaborate on like writing songs, you know, we have a musical together. That's like a whole thing. Um, but like as partners, a lot of the time we are, um, you know, we have phone check-ins, we connect on projects and as friends, um, we'll do small like collaborations together and prompts. Um, but it's not like, cause I feel like when you think of like a collaborator, you think of like, I don't know, two people making like a, like a sculpture or something. Um, so I feel like it's a much broader term. Even just someone who like is encouraging and supportive of our work is an artner because they're helping support the creation of the the whatever art form that we are doing. Um, and I do think that we're also in it together. Sometimes we have a competitive feeling against each other as creatives. And I definitely know I feel that sometimes. I'll see someone post something and like, oh, that's so good and they have so many likes and oh, they're taking away all the likes from me. <laughs> but really it's a healthier ecosystem with more of us thriving. So if you see someone and you feel those, that, that competitive, jealous feeling, you know, to me that's actually sort of a sign of partner love. Like when there's almost like intimidation there, it's like, oh, well that person is being really awesome. Like, well, let's go be friends with them. Like, don't be scared. Cause if anything we project, like we feel like that other people more confident than us as creatives because we naturally sort of put ourselves down versus realizing that we're all sort of experience a lot of these emotions like I might seem like I'm very like comfortable about certain things like oh Laura Lee she's so like confident about public speaking it's like well it's because I've been working really hard at it for years uh, but that's why if you like talk to me then I'll reveal that oh I'm just a human human just like you and so if we can work past some of the initial barriers we put up with each other as creatives. Um, oh, being supportive of each other is just so much, just so much easier. <laughs> um, but like my family are my partners too, because like, oh my gosh, my parents are tuned in last week and I couldn't just like imagine like them, like both watching and like, anyway, it's like, it's very warm fuzzy to help, to help each other 
help each other and support each other because it doesn't always come naturally. So with art marine, uh, I guess it's helpful also to me because the tenets of artnership are about health and healing. So it's not all about like the art projects. A lot of art marine to me is about life and how creativity fits into it because I can't be creative if my lower like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like if I don't feel safe and physically healthy, you know, um, I can't be productive, which is why most of my artist friends right now cannot focus on making art because the, the base of our needs has been so shaken up. It's hard to access more like accessing the subconscious and critical thinking. It's more like panic mode. So part of artnership is to keep stuff in your life healthy and stable so that you can be productive and make art. So I think I just want, that's really important to mention. Uh, so let me share the tenets of artnership. Ooh, ah, hopefully this is a little easier to see. It was a little bit bigger. Uh, I know I totally copied that Picasso heart, Picasso bouquet, because you know, steal from the best. Who steals from the best? Um, so in the bouquet of artner love, I have our five tenets, which are healing, connection, flexibility, success, and whimsy. And Lark and I came up with these tenants basically after figuring out why her and I were imploding. Because we met in, Bro in Brooklyn in like 2007. We were both like hustling hard and start like, oh, we were like working ourselves really intensely. Like we were going for it, but we were burning out. Um, and it was a few years later that we were like, we need to work on something together because we both need to evolve. We need to find a way to be healthy, productive, creatives who are successful and thriving so we can keep doing this work that we believe in. So let's help each other figure it out. And so her and I identified the big problems, our number one problems that were facing us. And so the tenants are designed to counteract them. So healing. This is designed to counteract mental and physical illness because creatives um, can have both issues. Sometimes it's physical, like if you're doing your 10,000 hours using a certain body part for all of that, you're going to like injure it. So like I do physical therapy twice a week just to like keep my wrists happy and going so I can actually draw. Um, but also the physical aspect because like if I'm drawing, I don't always eat uh, or sleep and uh, yeah, so that's like a huge thing with creatives, which I feel like everyone is on board with, that the healing, I feel like the healing is actually, it was the first one that we were like, yes, healing is what I need to counteract all the stress of what is happening. Then um, the connection one, which is also really relevant right now, um, was designed to ease isolation because a lot of us work by ourselves um, and we're sort of in our own world and it's a highly competitive feeling world right now too. So feeling that connection with other people, and I have a little exercise for that in a minute. Um, the next tenant that we were trying to help adjust to life is flexibility. This is designed to counteract the common creative issue of impossible expectations and rigid thinking. I've been thinking about this, actually I've been thinking about all these a lot lately because they're all really relevant right now. I feel like, oh great, I'm connected to, I'm forced right now to like have to really step up my game with all these. How can I be even more flexible about what a book tour looks like? How can I be really open-minded and let go of what I think something is supposed to be and re-see it as something completely new? So that flexibility uh, can be really hard also, especially when you have like an emotional attachment to what something was supposed to be or what your what a, an artwork of yours was supposed to be or setting a goal for yourself that is just so impossible that there's a way that you can meet it. So being flexible about our work, uh, about what medium it is, how long it will take, what the audience is, like all of our expectations, we can get really hung up on fitting it into a box. So an artner is also helpful to help you see it from a different point of view. Like maybe that idea of yours is not a book. Maybe it's a video. Maybe it's street art. 
Maybe it will take three times as long as you thought it was going to take, and that's all right. Um, the next tenant is, uh, is success. This one is designed to counteract the financial instability of the creative life, which I feel like many people who maybe were not in the creative life before are now experiencing is this insecurity of how am I going to survive and pay my bills and what am I going to monetize about myself? What needs out there can I meet? Um, Cause as a creative, I feel like I've spent a lot of time thinking about what I am monetizing about myself. Am I monetizing uh, my brain, my hands, my heart, my like, what am I trying to sell? Um, Cause sometimes as creatives, you try to sell the part of you that is also what you're doing for your personal work. Um, and it can actually backfire. So let's say if, you know, I'm doing illustration, um, if I'm doing freelance illustration, drawing other, other people's ideas all day, using that part of my brain, will I be able to come be home at night and make the illustrations that I need to make for my art therapy? Or am I going to be tap too tapped out? So I tend to think about with success, part of it is about developing like entrepreneurial skills and like business sense and embracing that side, which creatives often are a little resistant. Like, oh, I want like my agent to handle all that. I just want to make art. It's like, no, we're entrepreneurs. So you're actually running an entire business. So being realistic about what this means, but also being mindful about what you are selling and always being open to like changing your business model, especially now that everything's like thrown upside down. Um, and maybe it means redefining what success is to you. Like maybe it's not about what you thought it was. Like, do you have to get a publisher to publish your book? Or is it just about connecting with a specific audience? Can you do that in a different way? Um, so yeah, I could talk about that one. <laughs> I could talk about each of these all day long. I'm just going to finish with whimsy. Uh, whimsy is a very important one because uh, sometimes you forget to have fun and live life. I know, live life, like my little sign back here. Um, this one is designed to counteract burnout because there's something really noble about working ourselves to death. It's a very American value. Like, well, I spent 12 hours a day working on my book. Well, I spent 14 hours a day working on my book. Like, I don't know, we can go bonkers trying to like prove how hard we're working. But for me, the, like when I was working on Will and Wit, I didn't have any days off. Like I was working seven days a week on it and it was just, it was awful. I was just so like, I was drawing from like noon to midnight. It was really, and I was not making good work. So with Mona, I set healthy limits. It's like, okay, we got to at least have one day off a week and we're going to limit our drawing time. My brain was like, but you must draw. I was like, no, no, no. We're just going to trust that like if I limit it to these hours, I'm going to make good work in those hours. I know after six hours, I do not draw well. After six hours, it's so better to go and do something that's restorative and then come back to it than just like, it doesn't matter how many hours I've like logged in at my desk. Because if I'm not having some sort of fun, it, the work is going to suffer and it's going to show. Um, so even with my partner, sometimes we focus too much on like success and monetizing things and like the like, how are we going to get to their audience? It's like, oh yeah, we have to like, you know, do silly things too. Um, so I feel like actually this is the one I need to work on right now. So I'm making a note to myself and saying it publicly so I'm holding myself accountable. Um, Cause yeah, sometimes we take ourselves a little too seriously and our work too seriously and you know, we have to embrace sort of the absurdity of life. Um, and my, my little, let's see, my little prompt for you guys, cause I wanted to give you something to, to make in case you want to like make something today if you're feeling inspired. Um, it's like to challenge you to make a super powered high five for your studio or home office. So this is like one of mine, I've made different ones. This one has, has glitter on it. So actually it might not be good for high fiving because then you get glitter on your hands. Um, but it's, the idea started because in my, I made a handprint in my studio, well I had a handprint and I hung it up one day because I realized I'd finished something and I wanted like to turn to somebody and be like, I did it. I met that goal. That was great. But there was like no one to share in the moment with me. 
So I put little handprint up and I high fived handprint <laughs> on my wall. And it sounds really silly, but it made me feel better. Um, so I've sort of turned it into a lesson where you start off like tracing your handprint, um, but then adding to it different lines to represent other people who have your back. Because when I high five mine in my studio, I visualize behind the wall, I visualize all the hands of like all the people who have my back. So it's like the family, the friends, the ancestors, the readers, you know, librarians, like everybody. Cause then it's like super powered, charged, high five. Um, and it's, cause I feel like some of what the art, art is healing is cause it's really finding ways to trick ourselves into satisfying a need. So if I can't feel witnessed and supported when I'm alone in my studio in that moment, I can find a way to like give my imagination a mental picture to make me feel like I am supported by and witnessed by people. Um, so like for this one, the heart represents like my self-compassion. Um, then there's present tense me on uh, line on the inside is past tense me to represent like kid me who I feel like would be really excited about what I'm doing yet terrified about the situations like this doing live video <laughs> in front of people. Um, then future me, then like ancestors and yeah, family and friends and you know, so for each line I was thinking about a specific person, but you can do like different variation of this, but some sort of super powered high five for your studio. And just as a reminder is who might also be included in there. Cause I feel like I went through the list. Uh, actually, yeah, I can't go through all this list already. High five past tense me. And also, uh, it's helpful to hang photos in your studio of the people who are your partners or supporters or, you know, the people who tell you to keep the, keep motivating you, even if it's your historical mentors. But having some of those images in your studio is also really helpful to make you feel like you are connected to this bigger support system. Um, and it's not just you. And let's see. As I wrap up this one, I just thought I'd give you a few other prompts of how you can activate partner love in your life. Hold on, I need a sip of water. This is a lot of talking. Ugh. So how can you activate the art or love in your life? Uh, of course, having check-ins, which I feel like life right now is just lots of phone check-ins with everybody. Um, to share other people in your projects and in your process, just include them. You know, don't expect them to, you know, give you feedback like an editor might give you, but just a, you know, even just a, oh, that's interesting, you know, that's cool too. But just include them in your process instead of like, holding up and like I'm creating this 10,000 page book and I won't share it until it's done. It's like, no, like share whatever you got to share. Even if it's just like talking about one of the characters you've made, any part of the process you can share, get it out of your studio. Um, and let's see, and it's best to share it with people who are emotionally invested in your success. Cause sometimes the internet doesn't always want to support you. Um, I also asking for help is a huge part of engaging with partners for me. Um, yeah, asking for help, admitting you need help, or offering help. That's really a lot of what artnering is. Um, big fan of snail mail um, as a way to keep those connections strong. Swapping book, music, recommendations. Um, I love seeing like the pop up of all these like virtual book clubs and things. Uh, different ways to connect with each other. So if you really, I don't know, if you have an artner crush on somebody, then. You just find some way to like interact like, oh, hey, maybe we could like both watch this movie together. I'm like, oh, let me really talk about it. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and of course, then you can um, oh, and also helping connect each other with resources and um, and opportunities. I feel like that's a big part of what art narrating is. Um, and then, of course, you can agree to do regular prompts which I've seen a flurry of people doing different drawing prompts uh, online, but also it could be doing like a class together or a project, um, even just like a small artner dare of like, oh, we're both cleaning out our closets today. Like, cool, that's our challenge. It's all about clearing. Um, 
And, and I think another good Artner starter prompt is a Skillshare. So maybe teaching each other how to do something that you're, I don't know, that you want to learn from the other. To me, when it comes to Artnering, if you have someone you want to Artner with, generally what like Mark and I would do is with our bouquet of Artner tenants, we would sort of pick which one do we need right now. So be like, oh, right now I could really use some healing or some flexibility. Like, oh, okay, well, I could really use some, some flexibility. Like, okay, let's pick something to do that like taps into that. So actually this is sort of like the map that will sort of give us a landing point to then go off in a direction. Um, but first it's coming together to find something that you both are interested in doing or something you both need to sort of cultivate right now. And then you can sort of get into like some specifics, like, well, what's something we could do that would encourage flexibility? Like maybe let's each go do yoga outside and like take a photo and then send it to the other and like, okay, cool. Like, I don't know, I just made that up. Uh, <laughs> but we actually have a bunch of Artner, uh, all the prompts that Lark and I did in our first Artner collaboration are on our Tumblr page. So if you want to go through, you can like see all the different things that we came up with just as like a weekly prompt. Um, so, so yeah, but really any, it could be anything, um, uh, that makes you feel connected and supported. And I'm, and I'm sure you guys already have partners in your life. You might not call them that, but I hope that you guys will include them in your process. Okay. So let's see. Well, I've been talking for a long time already. <laughs> so I just want to... Check in with you. One question in the Q and A. If this is a good place to. Uh, oh go. yeah. Yes. What question? So Sandy Bartholomew said that she has trouble distinguishing between emotional and mental. So how do you tell them apart in terms of uh, self care plan? While you're Ooh. working through all the feelings, like all of those kinds of things. Just how do you uh, work through the. Uh, distinguish between the emotional and the mental. Aspect. How do I distinguish between the emotional and the mental? That's a really good question. I'm surprised I've never gotten that before. Um, yeah, because I, I guess I've thought, I've differentiated a lot between physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, partially because I think very much in medicine wheel, which I have here somewhere. Here's my, ah, here's my medicine wheel. Uh -huh. um, this is something, this is definitely a tool I use for a bunch of different things in life. It's a Native American uh, tool for healing, the, the medicine wheel. I want to give a shout out to the Monica Nation whose land we're on, because if I'm going to talk about indigenous wisdom, I got to give the proper credit. Um, so this concept is that as like a whole person, we are in life, we're constantly moving between these different realms of body, heart, mind, and spirit, you know, Southwest, Northeast. And this varies, uh, you know, there's different versions of this that are out there. So this isn't like the only version, um, but this is the one that I use in my life to help me put in context some of the things that I'm feeling and experiencing so for example, as when I, as, a, as an artist, I feel like we're often obsessed with the, the mind part because this is like the productive area. We think we're supposed to be making stuff all the time. Um, so, but when I'm creative, generally you start off like in your body, like living life and having experiences like down here, you know, like, um, and, uh, this is not a productive time for me. This is not when I'm sitting and like drawing about stuff. It's more like, oh, I just finished a book and now I'm going to go travel the world. <laughs> you know, I'm going to reconnect with my body, get back into physical exercise, have experiences. Then you go into the West, into the, the heart, and this is where you're reflecting on those experiences you just had. So this is more, I call this the emo phase. This is more where in like I'm deep in like the, I'm feeling the feels and like, oh, that thing that happened, I'm going to write about it, you know, and I'm going to obsess over it and da, da, da. And basically process all the stuff I just experienced in the world, in my body. But then you go up to the north in your mind and this is where you are taking all those experiences you've thought about and you're turning it into a product. You are turning it into something. 
So this is where like the distillation machine comes into play. And this is, you know, I always imagine like the artist in the garret with the scarf, like drawing into the late night hours. Um, Cause I think a lot of creatives think of this as like, we're supposed to be productive all the time. But it's like, actually that's just like a quarter of it. Because when you finish making the thing based on these experiences and these feelings, then you share it and you release it into the world. Um, actually, part of why doing this book tour virtually is weird for me is because part of releasing a book gives me closure and that feeling of witnessing. So it's emotionally confusing time to share it virtually. Um, but it's an important part of the closure to like put it out there, let it go, and then boom, you're back in your body again. You sort of got to start over. Like, okay, now we're going to have new experiences that we'll, we'll reflect upon and we'll make it into something and put it out there. And it's like this cycle. Um, so when I talk about mind and heart, this is sort of like make mind, body, heart, spirit. This is sort of what I'm thinking with, just to put that in context. And I guess... Um, is when it comes to differentiating between like the heart needs and the mind needs, the heart me, I don't know, in my mind, they're almost like personified as like different, like ages of me. <laughs> um, but I always feel like the, the heart part is much more tender and vulnerable. Um, the mind part is more my cerebral, um, I don't know. It's more like my Asperger's side. It's like. The part of me that is, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good way to explain the difference between them. Um, even when I'm gesturing, it's like this way. But I guess the mental, the mind stuff, it's more like on this logical, um, like detached level. It's more like an intellectual side. Because even as thinking about like what words I'm using, like if I'm overstimulated or versus overwhelmed, if I'm overwhelmed, normally it's like my heart is feeling overwhelmed. If I'm like overstimulated, it's more like a mental thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question because also it's such a subjective, a subjective um, way of also how you see yourself and how like I personify my different aspects so much and so i guess um i assume that everybody does that and talks to different parts of their personality but maybe not um but yeah the emotional stuff i don't know i think it also taps into what the struggle is like um because i feel like when i'm emotionally spent versus mentally spent it's a different it's a different depletion so maybe it just requires some paying attention to, um, I don't know, like when you have things come up, where do you feel it? What language are you using to describe it? And maybe it'll take some time to p pick apart what is an emotional issue versus what's a mental issue. Um, but, but yeah, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Was there another question? Dun, dun, dun. Oh. I listen to that comment. I guess characters from other states. Yeah, my, my counselor calls it parts when you personify your parts. Um, I used to think that it was unhealthy to personify different aspects of myself, that it was like, like compartmentalizing me too much. Because I really want to be a, a unified whole. I'm trying to heal myself. I mean, that's why I'm doing art. Um, so, but in some ways I do think it's helpful for some healthy personification and help healthy, you know, like also I invite you to even like, I don't know, draw them because <laughs> I've given form to a lot of the, the different things that I like here in my mind. So like I draw my, my genius, I draw my matter. Um, so I don't know, there's something to be said for using your creative skills to give form to these things that are really intangible. I mean, who's to say uh, what they are? Or, because also it's different for each person. Let's see. Were there any questions from the Facebook realms? I think it was the same question, just the, how do you tell the emotional and mental aspects of self-care? Mm. Same question, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess, the, yeah, mental, I imagine it's, it's like my student head, my, more my student self. 
Um, I think more about that, like who would be overstimulated and overwhelmed and overtaxed versus my emotional self, which is much more like little soft kid me. It's like, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Well, it's already, gosh, it's already like 11 o'clock. Wait, do I end at 11? Do I have time to talk about things? Have I been talking too long? Oh my goodness. Okay, well, I'm going to talk just a little bit about healing stuff in Mona before we, unless we have to log off now. <laughs> We're good until 11.30. Oh, 11.30. Oh, okay. So I still have 30 minutes. Oh, whew. okay. Cool, cool. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about, I'm going to redirect from uh, real world experiences to on paper experiences with books. Because I think that comics are an exciting new healing tool right now. And I wanted to share a little bit about how I explore that in my new book, but also in some other books that I have with me that I want to show off because it's exciting that it's not just me talking about this stuff. So in my new book, uh, The Dark Matter of Mona Star, ooh, ah, I got Mona back here. Hello, Mona. Um, yeah, in my new graphic novel, it's for young adults, but I wrote it for adults as well because I wanted to write something that would be, that would translate across, I don't know, different weirdos. Um, and so it's about my character dealing with depression, which I personify as the matter. And it, thankfully, I was, I was scared it was going to end up a really bummer of a book because I was like, oh, great, a book about depression. That sounds depressing, um, both to read and to make. But thankfully, it ended up more about healing and art and love, um, which I was like, whew. Because I was hoping to find some hope in her story. It was like the challenge I gave myself. Like, okay, I want to make a book about depression, but I want to find hope in it. And if I can do that for... Because part of me, I need to do that for myself. Because I feel hopeless sometimes. And I know that young people are dealing with a lot of, of despair um, at this moment. So it's like, I can't speak for everybody's personal experience and truth, but if, like, if I could find, if I could find a way to approach this topic that makes me feel better, then it's got to help somebody. Um, and so in her story, I actually model a bunch of the things that I've talked about. So in it, like, you know, she makes a self care plan, which she calls her don't die plan, um, which I have in the back of the book. But she also is modeling things in it, um, I don't know, that I guess are sort of targeted for my sort of weird. So I guess my weird is like, I'm highly sensitive, I'm an INFJ on the Myers-Briggs. I guess I've always been a rather obsessive person. I wouldn't say I'm OCD, but I'm obsessive. Um, I've been channeling it into rituals, you know, personally. Um, I definitely have bouts of depression. I'm not clinically depressed, but I have highs and lows. Like, I don't know, I feel a little weird about all the labels and like figuring out like, oh, what label are you? Uh, so I'm always like, I'm a human human. So I have my depressive-ish swings and I have my manic-ish swings, but I'm not like full blown. Um, and of course, like a lot of people, I have some trauma that's, that's in here that comes up. And so there's a little, I don't know, some flare ups of, of that. Um, so I guess that's my point of view with it. So I wanted her, it to be about resiliency because all these things are just things that, I don't know, make it hard to bounce back, make it hard to uh, move through different problems when they come up. So in Mona, she models um, like the self-care. She advocates for her health. There's a scene where she goes to the doctor and they're like, oh, you're fine. And she has, she's like, maybe I am, maybe I'm just making it up. Like, um, and so then she actually has to go back to the doctor and be like, no, we need to like run more tests because I had to do that. And it's really hard to stand up for yourself. So I want to make sure that that was addressed in the book. And I also wanted to show her struggling with meditation because I talk about meditation and I, I do it every night, 10 minutes before bed. I've been doing it for like four years now. But I started doing meditation in my early 20s, 
um, when I was stressed out because it was recommended, you should try meditation. And man, did I hate it. I hated it. I could not do it. I did it like on and off for a little bit and was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Um, so I have that in there because I feel like that's a common experience that something that maybe you know is helpful, it's not, oh, it's not going to be immediately helpful and that's okay. Uh, doesn't mean that you're not doing it wrong or it doesn't have wisdom for you. It's just also maybe it's not the right time. Um, and I also include in here a really strong music element. Um, I was really bummed in the book that, uh, like, where's a good moment? Like, there's all these scrolls of sheet music in the story. Like, I'll put that over there. Ah. And I actually created a visual... Like it's, it's placed strategically in the book and it is paired with songs. So you actually have a soundtrack to go with the, with the book, which, oh yeah, it's really nerdy. And I was hoping we could get the song lyrics in there, but we decided it was just too much of like a copyright issue. Um, because like me, she uses music to help, uh, curate her mood. So, um, I even had like a playlist in the back of like what I was listening to while working on it. Um, so I'm really big into how music, like music as a tool for helping cure, like manage my mood. Cause sometimes when I'm down, sad music makes me feel better. But then sometimes when I'm down, I'm like maybe I shouldn't be listening to so much depressing music and let's put on something upbeat. Um, so that's in there. I also have, um, I wanted to have Mona as a volunteer. Cause when I was, I feel like part of the reason I didn't get depressed in high school was because I was a really bit, I was a really active volunteer and uh, I was a girl scout and I did my gold award and everything. And I always had, I was tapping into opportunities of like service and feeling like that, like I was contributing to solving problems in the real world in a way that was really empowering and made me feel like it was a good like outlet. Um, so instead of directing some of that energy um, to beating up myself, I could take that energy and apply it to something that felt useful. And it was, yeah, so actually I have that in her story because I do feel like that, yeah, serving in some sort of way is really, that's definitely, it's also part of my self care plan. Um, so it's like, yeah, if you're feeling really down, like, I don't know, go out and pick up some trash and then you can't beat yourself up because you did something nice. Um, and so that's in her story. She works actually, she volunteers at the Haven, which is the a local day shelter here in Charlottesville. Um, and what else did I have her? Oh, she sees a therapist. My publisher was really excited about the fact that I, that I could like normalize Mona seeing a therapist because it's not a weird thing. In fact, like most people I know see some sort of healthcare professional. So how come I don't see that reflected in young adult fiction? Cause it's not weird. It's more the norm now. Um, so I was really excited about that. Uh, and what else did she do? Oh, and I also model doing art therapy with yourself. So I have her at one point, um, taking her matter and putting it into a jar and painting with it. Oh, here it is. And of course music is, is a part of it too. So he, here she's like, it's such a great example of like, yeah, some, like whatever you have, like paint it, draw it, use it. So if you have your matter whispering in your ear, some stuff like, okay, well I'm just gonna put you on the paper and then I don't have to carry you around anymore. Um, so, and of course, art nor love is the other thing that I really got to explore with this because Mona, uh, cause a love story in the book is an art nor love story. It's not like, um, I don't know. Cause I feel like the romantic love is really fun. Like in page by page, uh, there's a romantic love story and everyone really likes that, but I've really wanted to challenge what. I don't know what love is. So the love story in Will and Wit is actually the family love story. It's Will and her um, Aunt Ella. So to me, that's the main love story in it. And the love story in The Dark Matter is between um, Mona and new girl Haley, who is a cellist who Mona falls in art in her love with. Ooh, let me find that page. Fall in art in her love. Oh yes, this is when she falls in, in art in her love. Cause she sees uh, 
Haley playing her cello all passionately. She's like, oh, who's that girl? Oh, what are these feelings? Like, do I like like her? Do I want to make out with her? Do I want to make art with her? Because sometimes it's confusing and how you love somebody. You just know you, you have sparks. Um, so that's another. So they end up coming together and becoming friends and helping each other come out of their shell. Um, yeah, so I feel like, yeah, actually when I look at my list here, I have a lot of healing in this book, um, which I'm like super proud of. So like, I'm on the book. Yeah, because, uh, and I'm even more excited that this is part of this bigger genre of graphic medicine, uh, which I mentioned this conference is with. I only discovered this term like, I don't know, less than a year ago. And I was so excited because as an artist, I've never fit in a box. Like when I was making, you know, my illustrations, like in my sketchbooks and stuff, like, oh, here's like my, you know, headache. Um, for years when I was making my art, I didn't fit in anywhere. And I discovered graphic novels and I was like, oh cool, this is a format that I can fit. You know, cause it's like tofu, it just fits whatever, you know, soaks up whatever flavor you put it in. So I was like, oh, I can take my weird style and adapt it to comics and I fit in. But even in comics, I didn't fit in anywhere because no one else was making stories drawing about the inner world of their character, you know. Um, so discover this new category about health and healing within comics has been so empowering to realize it's not just me that is talking about this stuff. That this is part of a broader conversation and it's a movement and it's something that I think we need right now because I think there's so much like superhero stuff in comics. Graphic medicine is almost like this lovely antidote because it's the opposite. It's more about emotional integrity versus like physical prowess. Um, and it's like a different side of the hero's journey that I've been walking that is less about the externalized experience, more about like this inner experience. So I think it's just so, I'm so excited about it and I cannot wait to connect with this community in person at some point because that's part of the reason I was so excited about this conference so I hope that we can continue online um, and I'll have to need one more sip of water mm. okay yeah and just to be clear so graphic medicine it was coined by Ian Williams just to give proper credit here um, and he defines it as stories at the intersection of comics and healthcare so it's mental health and physical health um, and it also, I think it includes stuff that is about ad advocacy and like social justice. I think that it is like a political act almost to just assert who you are in the world as, as you are. And if you don't fit into certain paradigms of what is normal, then helping create, create these new pathways for people like you, I feel like, I don't know, to me, that's sort of what it's about and to curate conversations about being humans. Um, and also just reflecting the shifting norms in our society and what stories are being told. So I think it's very exciting. Um, so yes, it is hopeful because it, of course, it normalizes discussions about our collective health, things like, yes, it's a, normal to have a therapist and yeah, there's nothing wrong with you if you have certain feelings that maybe are inconvenient in your life. Um, because really what's important is to help start conversations about these things. Cause I think you often can swallow stuff back and you're like, oh, it's just me. There's something wrong with me versus if you see it reflected in a character, for example, then it's a little easier to be like, oh, maybe this is something that I can open up about because it's not just me. Um, especially if it's something that's like difficult. Um, and of course... Yeah, I do think that comics is a great outlet for these sort this the sort of content because visually, I think it can I don't know. There's a different sort of empathy that I experience when I relate to a picture than to a block of text. It sort of opens up more visceral feelings in me when I see it because I'm a, maybe because I'm a visual thinker. Um but also I can sort of, when I'm reading like their body language and their facial expression and how the artist draws that, I feel like it captures, it captures a lot. 
and if it's not all explained in text and I'm just interpreting a picture, I can make, I can like, I don't know, I can personalize and make a little more about me instead. Um, and also I think it makes it a little easier to digest <laughs> uh, in a comic form, especially if you're showing like altered states or a character's inner experience or if you're personifying things. Because sometimes reading blocks of text, my brain would get confused over what was real versus what was in their head, and I'm trying to like keep it all straight. But if it's a comic, you can just draw any combination of it, and it'll make sense. <laughs> uh, because it's a you can unify the imagined and the real all in one image. At least that's what I do. Uh, so I want to share some of my some uh, my favorite graphic novel books. Some of them I don't have and I wanted to go to the library and get them, but then I was freaked out about going to the library, so I'm like, ah! So I have like most of them. Okay, so of course I want to give a shout out to uh, to Lucy Nisley, who is going to be the, um, the keynote um, at the conference, but something came up. But her new book, which I just started actually, but about her pregnancy and um, birth of her son. So for any of the mamas out there who need some relatable stories about other fierce mamas, there's this one, <laughs> Kid Gloves. And also, um, let's see, other sort of health, more physical health ones. Of course, we have this one when David lost his voice um, by Judith, oh, I can't say her last name. Varnestendal? Sorry, I'm not the... I should have looked up these things ahead of time. Um, but this one is sort of about her... Um, her grandfather dying of cancer and dealing with like end-of-life um, transitions. Yeah, it's, it's, not the happiest, it's not the happiest book. It's a really beautiful book, though. Um, then another physical healing one is David Small Stitches. Um, this is about when he was a kid and got his, oh, it's been a while since I read it, he got his like vocal cord removed and he lost his voice. Um, oh yeah, okay, I should like flip these open because I got these here. But oh, I love his watercolor style. I feel like it's very evocative, especially because he's drawing about old memories. Um, here, I'll show you a little bit of where David lost his voice. This one's a little more colorful. Actually kind of a similar style. Oh, I have all sorts of things in here. Yeah. And let's see. I got, oh, by my friend, by my girl Jennifer Hayden. I have her book about um, her experience with breast cancer, but it's sort of a love letter to her breasts for her whole life. So it's called The Story of My Tits. Sorry, children. Um, but yeah, she's the only other cartoonist I know who uses stippling sometimes. But yeah, her style is so much fun. Um, it's almost like a little Instagram format with the, the picture and caption. But it's, yeah, it's really interesting to see the whole story, like from birth to through adulthood about like our identity as a woman in our body associated with um with our breasts i just said breasts on my video oh my god okay moving on <laughs> and other books that i don't have with me about physical health are let's see ooh um I didn't, re I didn't think of this one as graphic medicine, but then after I was, I was, uh, then I saw a mention online. It was like, oh, Black Hole by Charles Burns. I forgot that it's about sexually transmitted diseases. I just remember the characters all evolve, um, like different sort of side effects, like tales and things. Um, but yeah, I guess it, it is about like sexual health. Um, and. All right, I think those are all the physical ones. Now I'm gonna go on to the, the mental ones. Oh, I guess Raina's is, Raina's is sort of, uh, I mean, all Raina's books explore the connection between like mind and body and like anxiety and things. So like Guts, this came out in the fall. Um, it's about her when she was, in I guess middle school, dealing with anxiety and sort of emerging irritable bowel syndrome. 
um, and about her connection with like food um, and uh, yeah, f learning how to label different physical feelings and emotional feelings because that can be confusing of like what's going on. Um, so yeah, so this is really great, especially for the younger readers to help start these conversations. And other ones with mental health. Well, of course, the first graphic novel I ever read was Fun Home, which um, deals with coming out, but also deals with suicide. Um, and so I, I guess I put, yeah, I put her in this category too, because she is exploring, yeah, the mental health side of things. And of course, Ellen Forty's Marbles. This, it was probably reading this book that made me feel like brave enough to actually tackle talking about my own emotions because she did it in such a beautiful, gosh, I'm, I have like things inside all these books. <laughs> Because she explores her, um, like she draws about everything in such, uh, it's an, it's both personal and educational at the same time. So, um, yeah, and she has like all her sketches, like she's really good at drawing her different mental states visually as well. So I think that's really super inspiring for me as a storyteller. Uh, but yeah, this one's about manic depression, um, and let's see, other ones that I don't have with me include um, Lighter Than My Shadow by Katie Green. Um, she, in the book, it's about eating her eating disorders um, and some trauma and other stuff. Um, but in it, she draws it like how I draw my matter, almost as like this dark cloud that's like surrounding her and enveloping her. So it's really interesting and creepy how we're drawing a similar image to capture this invisible force that we feel like is affecting us. So it's, uh, it's like, what are we really drawing about? Uh, then also, uh, then there's doo -doo -doo, Spinning by Tilly Walden. Um, it's sort of a figure skating teenage autobiographical coming out story. Um, so it's about a bunch of things tied up in a bow of sort of what a teenager is going through, trying to be perfect, but also feeling like they're not fitting into the norm. Um, and RX by Rachel Lindsay, which my partner is borrowing right now, so I can't hold it up for you. But it's about her experience working in the pharmaceutical industry while taking pharmaceuticals and ultimately having like a mental breakdown. And so if you're more interested, so if, if you're interested in like the, um, the pharmaceutical side of things because I've definitely gotten a lot of questions about that at panels in the past. Mm. I would recommend Rachel's book, Rx and Marbles, because she also gets into like the pharmaceutical stuff too. Because um, it's not my area of expertise, so I will recommend other books. <laughs> and then, let me see, is there another one? Oh, and lastly, Hey Kiddo by Jarrett Krasowska. I'm not good. Sorry, Jared. I've met you, but I like can't get your last name. Um, I don't know where my copy is, so if you borrowed it, then please let me know because I can't find mine anywhere. But it's about growing up with family addiction, um, and I I feel like I've, it's a really good book, and I love that it's written by a man because a lot of the graphic medicine -y books that I've resonated with are written by women starting these conversations. So I'm, I'm like, yes, guys, get in on this too. Guys, please creep, like, let's show from your point of view, like what it, it's like to navigate these emotions and develop this emotional intelligence. Um, Cause that's a need I definitely see out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess the last thing I'll mention about this is that there are, some of these books have discussion guides online. So if you read something that um, really resonates with you like look online and the author might have made one I've made one for page by page but I haven't yet for Mona so but I'll be doing that in the near future once I finish adapting to this virtual book tour and maybe even have a virtual book club with some of your friends um. <laughs> okay there it is and I see Sarah's pop popped up back on my screen. So um, just real quick, two things. Uh, 
Tom's Cancer um, by Brian Fees, who was our uh, keynote yesterday, was recommended ah. in the chat by Kelly Hamm. And then also Speak by Lori Anderson, uh, which is about teen oh. rape, bullying, and mental health. Oh. Um, both so, yes. the two that I was going to recommend, uh, you mentioned both of them. I think that RX by Rachel Lindsay is a great companion piece to Marvels because they had completely different experiences. Mm. So, um, Ellen Forney and Marvels, she goes through, and it's a lot about how she was a little bit resistant to the diagnosis because she was afraid that it would um, mess with her art if she uh, was in therapy, it was uh, medicated, things like that. Um, Whereas in Rachel's, she was basically doing everything right and still ended up being uh, institutionalized. And so yeah. the counterpoint of the two is very, makes a very sort of interesting conversation. So um, I think also, we all can talk about from different angles and you might not think yeah. that your point of view is important, but it's balancing a conversation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and then and Hey Kiddo is another one that I always like to recommend because uh, it's amazing. But also, uh, um, Jared is from Worcester, and Worcester plays a pretty big uh, oh, yeah. role in uh, the story. So, since I am uh, in Worcester and uh, our offices are in Worcester, we uh, a little Worcester pride there. Um, so, the last thing or one of the last things, if there are questions, we still have a little bit of time. Um, there was in the chat a mention of the fact that many teen librarians are looking for uh, things that work with their audiences. So could you help us by letting us know where we can get the dark matter of Mona Star for libraries? Uh, yes, it's in my, my closing notes. <laughs> yeah, you can. Get the dark matter. Oh, I put my website up. This, oh, I'm smart this time. Um, yeah, on my website, I just sent out my first batch of books yesterday. So thank you everybody who put in like pre-orders. Um, especially since I have so many books that I bought for in-person events, which now I'm not going to be at. So now I'm like, yeah, I spent like eight hundred dollars on books, and now they're just sitting in my house. So please buy some, or from your local independent bookstore too. Um, if you buy it for me, I can personalize it for you and uh, also have the sketchbook dares if you're interested in that because I feel like that's also helpful right now, especially if people are at home and need some structure and an outlet for their creativity. Um, and I want to also mention that my next video, which is not the conference, it'll just be a regular Facebook live video, but that'll be uh, next Saturday. I'm doing these Facebook live videos every Saturday for like, I don't know, I guess six more weeks at least. Um, so there, the next one is gonna be about mental health and YA comics. And I'm gonna be with MK England, a local young adult author. So I'm not sure if we'll, she'll be in person with me or we'll do sort of a puppet version. Um, we'll see, it'll be something. Um, and I wanna thank, um, my artner Lauren Larkin for helping out with the Facebook Live video on here and help and my artner Dwar King for helping me get all set up here. And um da, da, da. Oh, and lastly, I want to show off my magic shoes this week. So these are this week's magic shoes. Because on my book tour I made I've been one I was like, I have magic shoes. So these are snakeskin in this well fake snakeskin because vegetarian. Um in the spirit of yeah evolving in this moment and adapting and being flexible um <laughs> and i think oh and if you're locally i'm in seville weekly this week with an article about how covid is affecting local artists having to be creative and adapt so yeah okay that's all the stuff <laughs> so cool unless there's any final questions from how does your... Oh, there's one more question. Self-care plan relate to your self-compassion practices? How does my self-care plan relate to my self-compassion practices? Or Leia. Hmm? Leia's question. Ah, Leia's question. Um, well, I guess 
self-care is self-compassion um because part of even acknowledging that you have needs and standing up for them is an act of kindness for yourself um which i've been thinking about a lot lately is i've i've literally been saying to myself like being more, like be more gentle and kind <laughs> because i've been really hard on myself through all of this um like on how to like adapt the most and be the most productive and, rah, rah, rah. and it's like no it's like we gotta be gentle and make sure that it's you don't know we don't have to like to not impose some of these restrictions and expectations on ourselves so being flexible within the self-care plan is part of that too that you're not going to do all of it but even just acknowledging that you do have needs and you are important enough to stand up for those needs and that you are worth that love and attention and nourishment yourself as a human being that is definitely yeah just that that's a huge act of compassion <laughs> uh, i want to say thank you everybody for tuning in Hi. oh i gotta find something <laughs> oh i hope this was helpful to everybody and please reach out oh i forgot to switch this over whoops whatever it's live <laughs> so very cool well i guess uh yeah thank you for sarah having me at the conference thank you facebook live peeps for watching and yeah i'll see you guys uh next week and yeah please shoot me uh email or find me on my website awesome <laughs>